Food systems around the world are dependent on supply chains that connect the fate of consumers in one region to producers in another. A range of major problems are already buffeting these systems, from a chronic failure to provide adequate nutrition to growing environmental shocks. This episode considers food systems, the problems facing these systems and the fragilities inherent to them, and ask what these mean in an uncertain future. And to do so, I'm joined by Raj Patel, an award-winning author, filmmaker, and academic with voluminous experience and expertise in understanding and seeking change in food systems. Among other positions, he's currently a research professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. And his latest book, co-written with academic Jason W. Moore, is a history of the world in seven cheap things. Raj, welcome. And can we start with an overview of what people mean when they talk about the food system or food systems? Well, um, I'm glad that you already sort of hinted at it, Laurie, that, that, that um, the food system is different from supply chains. Normally, when you think of food systems, you're thinking all oh, farm to fork uh, and the food system might in, in some in some imagination be the journey from you know, the, the, the land to, to your plate. Um, but the supply chain is an outcome of a more sophisticated and a much longer term series of operations of power. Um, and the food system is essentially th that history. It's the history of a, of a world political ecology that has come together to normalize certain kinds of relationships of power that allow uh, food to journey from specific farms to specific forks. Um, so, you know, we, we could take any, any number of examples, but, you know, why is it, for example, that people in the global north are used to bananas or coffee or tropical products? Well, it's, it's a long history of colonization and then a long history of, uh, you know, subsequent decolonization and trade agreements and uh, indebtedness that really allow countries in the global south limited options in terms of, you know, decolonizing that land and moving away to something else. And instead, uh, we in the global north think it's normal and natural and unthinkable uh, that we could live without coffee um, and, uh, you know, or you know, that we, we might have a life without uh, chocolate whenever we want it. Uh, and that is essentially the, the, the food system at work. It's a series of, as I say, operations of power that allow uh, certain sort of routes and exchanges to appear normal when in fact they are the product of usually a fairly bloody uh, an exploitative history. Mm. And uh, at least from a Global North perspective, when you ask people, well, what, what are the problems within these systems? Often people will point to a chronic lack of nutrition, to hunger around the world, and increasingly food waste. Now, I'm assuming those are issues that you have at the top of your agenda when you look at the fragilities in food systems. Could you talk a bit more about those as well as the other major problems or fragilities that we see in food systems across the world? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so if you understand the food system as the, in, in the way that we've just laid out, then um, it's not surprising that the outcomes of this food system are, the con you know, are, are synonymous with exploitation and with the maximization of profit. Uh, and when the food system is set up to maximize profit, it's set up to pay workers as little as possible, uh, and it's set up to uh, generate the kinds of outcomes uh, and the, the kinds of products that are uh, mo most profitable. Uh, and so that's why we end up uh, on, on the consumer end with food products that are uh, high in salt and fat and sugar, uh, that are uh, you know, engineered to be craved and to be bought again and again, uh, that are marketed aggressively uh, to, you know, to, to the young, to bake in certain kinds of habits, uh, and that lead ultimately the, to the kinds of situation where now we have two billion people who are overweight. Mm. Um, and at the same time, uh, we have a food system that, as I say, is geared towards paying as little as possible for labor. And so here in the United States, for instance, uh, seven of the 10 worst paying jobs in America are in the food system. Uh, and they're not, not just about farm work, the farm work and uh, farm labor and the, you know, the, the sort of immigration complex around that in the United States is part of the story, but also uh, you know, low paid uh, minimum paid, you know, sort of minimum wage tip work uh, in, in the restaurant industry, um, you know, line cooks and uh, dishwashers. Uh, these are all positions that are paid incredibly little. 
uh, and are paid so by design. I mean, you know, this is in the United States is after all, um, you know, the, the, the outcome of a, a huge agricultural economy um, that was built on slavery and built on the dispossession uh, of land from Native Americans and the genocide that, that, that comes from it. So, you know, if, if we're thinking about outcomes, then systemic racism and, uh, you know, systemic inequities in income are part of the story, certainly in the United States, but also writ globally uh, of a, a food system that requires cheap inputs of land and labor uh, and that spits out the kinds of products that are obesogenic. Um, at the same time, uh, these, you know, these vulnerabilities lead to uh, the, the, a situation where we have uh, 2 billion people who are overweight, but oddly, 2 billion people who are uh, food insecure. And this was before COVID. Right. Before COVID, there were two billion people who were food insecure, which is to say uh, that they were uh, at some point during a month uncertain about where their meal was coming from. Um, and th there were 820 odd million people who were malnourished and didn't have enough uh, calories to be able to lead a healthy and productive life. Over the course of a year, uh, they were malnourished. They were denied these calories. And that, that's a very high bar uh, for understanding what it is to be hungry. Uh, and yet 800 uh, odd million people cleared it. Again, this was before COVID. Uh, and the numbers who are uh, food insecure and the numbers who are malnourished are going to be going up. As, uh, there was already a trend line going up and, and now it's been made worse. So the fragility is in the inability of people to be able to afford food, which is itself a systemic outcome of the food system because the food system pays so little. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, uh, this is part of the, the reason that the food system is dangerous is because it has managed uh, in, in its construction to concentrate power. Um, one of the, the sort of visuals I use is if you imagine a sort of hourglass that's wide at the top, narrow in the middle and wide at the bottom. At the top, there are uh, the hundreds of millions of people who grow food. Uh, at the bottom, the billions who eat. And in the middle, uh, there's just a few corporations that, are, uh, that, that control the global economy. And you can think of that as a fragility because uh, the global economy, uh, and, and by the global economy, but what I mean is that within any given agricultural market internationally, um, the number of players that control more than 50% of the market is five or six. Uh, mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's much less. Uh, and that systematic concentration of power uh, is something that is a vulnerability because when you don't have uh, distributed, you know, uh, you don't have capacity uh, and robustness in the supply chains, then you end up, as we see under COVID, uh, with a fragility where one small uh, trip up in, a, in the supply chain can lead to cascading dysfunction all the way down. Uh, so whether that is of milk producers having to, to sort of pour away their uh, excess uh, product mm -hmm. or whether it's about um, the, the, the COVID outbreaks in meat processing plants, all of these are uh, you know, outcomes of a, a very concentrated supply system with tight supply chains that, that, you know, that stretch across the globe uh, and where one little uh, error, one, one, one little mistake, one little dysfunction uh, causes a cascading problem. And this matters for, for uh, communities that are interested in climate change because you can have woven together uh, a range of fragilities that come on top of one another. So for example, because supply chains are so tight around the world, when you have a, um, you know, a, a, a massive forest fire, for example, in Russia, uh, and then Russia imposes grain export uh, bans, then you have the price of wheat going up around the world, and then you have bread riots, and then you have, uh, you know, then you have in other parts of the world, uh, violence and uprisings, as a result of a cascading, you know, the, the cascade of a, 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 you know, a, a once in 500 year drought uh, in, in, in Russia. Uh, those kinds of interactions are, the, you know, are a sign again of the fragility that comes from this sort of global uh, and yet redundancy free food system. And as we look to the future, how do you think those fragilities are gonna play out? And in particular, what kind of changes are you seeing now where people have recognized these fragilities and they're beginning to work on them? Even people who have explicitly recognized the kind of cascading effects that you've described and are starting to talk about those, um, 
potential problems and a warning about them and then are trying to drive change with that in mind? Well, you know, I mean, this is, uh, I'm sure that there are other people who have observed this. I mean, the best of times and the worst of times. I mean, at one level, uh, you're seeing uh, a resurgence of the, the sort of short supply chain, uh, you know, local farmers uh, growing food, growing food products, not commodity products, not corn and beans, uh, sorry, good corn and soy uh, and, you know, cotton and wheat, but instead uh, growing uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and some staples for, for a local market. Those small sustainable farmers who operate things like community supported agriculture initiatives, they're doing tremendously well. Uh, my, my friends who are farmers who are in that game can't, you know, can't hire enough people to work uh, and they're doing very well uh, and the people who can afford to subscribe to these kinds of community supported agriculture initiatives where you get your vegetable box once a week, um, yeah, everyone's happy who is able to do that. The problem, of course, is that not, not everyone's able to do that. Uh, you know, we're living in the middle of grinding poverty and increasing unemployment uh, across the planet. And if you are not lucky enough to be able to afford your you know, high-end vegetable box, uh, then things are looking much grimmer. Uh, and this is being compounded by the, 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 the kinds of legislation that we see, say, the Trump administration doing, of uh, re you know, deciding that, yes, there are some workers who are essential, uh, but we're not going to pay them anymore, and we're just merely going to say that they're essential, and that means expendable, sacrificial. Uh, and if you look, for example, at the Trump administration decision to uh, say that uh, meatpacking plants are uh, essential services, what that means uh, is that you've got workers being brought into the, the slaughterhouse floor, uh, and the slaughterhouses are now zones of, of COVID infection. And uh, the, the, uh, you know, you, you're seeing just the imposition of certain kinds of, uh, of, of, of norms within the food system. Uh, and those norms, are, you know, the workers have very little choice about it. So the response to these kinds of fragilities goes both ways. You, you can see community supported uh, initiatives on the one hand doing well. Um, you can see uh, that groups uh, who have long supported uh, the idea of sort of you know, self-sufficiency um, and uh, you know, food sovereignty within their communities, they're, uh, they're, they're able to weather the storm a little better. Um, but at the same time, you're seeing the food system uh, getting, you know, feeding itself very handsomely from the trough of, of the handouts that uh, the government has given. Uh, and you can see them using their power to enact certain kinds of legislation, or you know, to, to get the government to enact certain kinds of legislation that continues uh, to sacrifice workers, and in fact sacrifices them at an increased rate in order that profits be maintained. Uh, so, you know, the, the, we, we are facing um, this... Uh, you know, this fork in the road, and uh, you, you're seeing movements rise up, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of fight the, the good fight. Uh, but you're also seeing the food industry doing very well out of this, uh, you know, out of this moment, and uh, and, and that's a, that's a great source of work. Raj Patel, thank you for talking with us today. It's good to be alive. <laughs>